Known as the movie capital of the world, bringing films to audiences that provide entertainment and at times thought-provoking drama, Hollywood recently hosted a different kind of media through a unique forum broadcast live worldwide on Supreme Master Television on Saturday, July 26, 2008. The Climate Change International Conference was held at the Pacific Design Center in West Hollywood, California, USA. Organized by the Supreme Master Ching Hai International Association, it was a conference that brought together green Hollywood celebrities and notable speakers. Co-hosted by Emmy Award-winning television journalist and vegan Jane Velez Mitchell, the event was informative and the subject matter highly relevant. Three panels were conducted, each with a different theme, the urgent scientific facts of the climate crisis, its spiritual perspectives, and the transformational role of the media. Invited as a special guest speaker, Supreme Master Ching Hai graciously attended via live video conference to answer questions from the panelists as well as the audience. We now invite you to join us for the rebroadcast of the Climate Change International Conference. Welcome everyone from the heart of Hollywood, California. I want to welcome you to this historic live broadcast. We're talking SOS climate change. I'm investigative journalist Jane Velez Mitchell, and this is truly a first. Right now, this program is going into millions of households worldwide on 14 television satellite platforms, as well as on the internet. This is a special broadcast from Supreme Master Television. Let's hear it for this effort. and vegetables and stop eating so many hamburgers? Yeah. We are, that's for sure. Through this global event, the world is coming together to take immediate action on runaway climate change and the food crisis. Together, we can do something to avert a real catastrophe in the making right now. From Iceland to the Bahamas, from the Amazon to Stonehenge, the world is watching, and what do we want? We want action, don't we? Yeah. Action! Yeah. All right. We're going to change the world today. Let's begin with a prayer. It is my pleasure to introduce Janelle Romero, the founder of Red Nation Television, to lead us in a Native American Lakota prayer for who else? Mother Earth. I stand before you on the shoulders of my ancestors, the bloodline of Geronimo. We received a call this morning from the Hopi asking us all to listen carefully as this is an important day. My Indian name is Oyate Wianka Powin. People see this woman. It was given to me by Chief Leonard Crodog from the Lakota Nation. I'm going to open with a prayer song. It's the Thunder Bean song from our Lakota people. It's a very ancient, ancient song. And um, it's very auspicious to have this song for this day because it will bring the water that we desperately need, the, the Maniwaka, the sacred water. There's only one earth, one sky, one sun, one moon, one water, one you and one me, and we're all here together. Ahomotakiwase. Yeah. 
I pray for peace and health to all of you. Mahomatakyase. Wow. What a beautiful prayer. And I also prayed for all the animals trapped on factory farms across the world as we pray for our fellow human beings. Now, we have a passionate message sent all the way from Delhi, India, from one of the world's leading experts on the environment. A former director of the UN Environment Program, Dr. Ashok Koshla, was awarded what is considered the Nobel Prize of the Environmental World and is president of the prestigious Club of Rome. He now offers an effective solution to global warming. Hi, I'm Ashok Khosla, and I bring greetings to you all the way from Development Alternatives in New Delhi, India. My greetings particularly to those among you who have dedicated yourselves to making the world a better place for all. Climate change is one of the biggest threats faced by humankind since the beginning of history. And so is the massive extinction of species that is going on right now, and the disappearance of our forests and fish stocks and the depletion of our energy and mineral resources. In fact, over the past few months, the biggest issues have been the prices of oil for our cars and food for our stomachs. Things seem to be coming all of a sudden to a head. Our past actions and behavior may already be catching up with us. Your meeting today is about the role of meat in our diets and its impact on the world around us. Let me begin by admitting a bias. I have been a vegetarian for a very long time. In fact, all my life, I was born a vegetarian. This was an individual, personal decision, not imposed by religious, family, or other obligations. But until recently, I have never felt the need to preach or proselytize vegetarianism to others. But now, I'm beginning to wonder whether that is right or fair to my fellow humans. You see, eating meat has become very dangerous. It can even kill. It can kill other people, for example, by taking away the resources needed to produce food for them. More than half of US farmland is devoted to beef production. You know, it takes one acre to produce 250 pounds of beef. That same acre can produce 40,000 pounds of potatoes, 160 times as much. Meat can kill you. The risk of various types of cancer increases by three to four times for people who eat meat. If an American has a heart attack, the risk of death is something like 50% for an average person. Risk comes down to 15% if he eats no meat. And it comes down to some 4% if he eats no meat, dairy, or eggs. And meat can kill all of us, our planet, and all life on it. As you all know, the cause of global warming is greenhouse effects from greenhouse gases carbon dioxide mainly and methane emissions from fossil fuels, and these are increased greatly in the production of meat. Three times more fossil fuels are needed to produce meat-centered diets than a meat-free diet. Livestock production uses more than half of all the water used for all purposes in the U.S. In fact, producing one cow needs enough water to float a small ship. It would take 260 years to use up the world's oil resources if people gave up eating meat today. It would take 13 years to exhaust the same world's known oil reserves if every human being started eating meat in the same manner as the U.S. today. This is not a minor issue.
Vegetarians can be as healthy and strong as medians. There are well-known sports persons who have done extremely well on vegetarian diets. In fact, David Scott, who was six times Ironman triathlon winner, is a vegetarian. And I am still here after 68 years of eating no meat. All in all, I can strongly recommend a meat-free diet. The less demand there is for meat and dairy, the fewer the animals we will produce, the less the greenhouse gases we will emit, global warming and climate change will come down, and it is now up to each one of us to take responsibility for our future. Thank you. Have a very good meal. Very well put. Meat kills, especially the animal who is killed for the meat. That's why we like to say peace begins on your plate. So all of you out there who say you're peaceful and you want world peace, start it right on your plate. You know, this movement is really being embraced by Hollywood. A lot of Hollywood celebrities have gone vegan, and some of them are in this room right now. And now we would like to introduce the mayor of West Hollywood, Jeffrey Prang. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here this afternoon. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Prang. I'm the mayor of West Hollywood and uh, proud to say that I'm a progressive mayor of one of the nation's most progressive cities. We're really proud to be able to play host to today's, uh, today's conference. Um, West Hollywood has uh, been a leader on a number of progressive issues over the years. In fact, we like to, to pride ourselves on being first on a lot of the most important issues of the day. We were the first city in the country to pass a ban on Saturday night specials and our leader on gun control. We are the foremost city in leading on uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender civil rights. We are a leader in the animal welfare community. We are a dense urban city, but at the same time, we have been one of the foremost leaders on environmental policy. And that's why it's uh, uh, particularly important as we're discussing climate change that for me that this conference is hosted here in the city of, uh, of West Hollywood. Preparing today, being together today to talk about these important issues about, uh, about our environment, about uh, climate change is essential. We are building public education amongst members throughout the country and throughout the world, as well as our elected leaders. And, uh, and, and come January, we have a tremendous amount of work to do. And I am optimistic. I'm optimistic about the, the goals of today's, uh, of today's conferences and conferences like this taking place all over, the, over this nation. So on behalf of my colleagues on the city council and the entire city of West Hollywood, I want to welcome you here to our community. And thank you for the leadership that you're providing. West Hollywood, as always, uh, is, is eager and prepared to stand with you in this, uh, in this fight. Thank you so much. And I would like to say that there are a lot of vegan restaurants and vegan options offered in West Hollywood. And we love that, don't we? Yeah. Woo! As we've been saying, climate change is a worldwide movement. And we've got an international, a truly international set here today. And I'm not just referring to myself. Now, I'd like to introduce my co-host for this amazing live broadcast from Canada, writer Donald Gilmore. Thank you, Jane. The climate change crisis is no longer a subject of debate. Scientists, politicians, Corporate leaders and religious leaders of all faiths are urging the public to change their lifestyle to curb global warming by recycling more and using less energy and water. However, the most effective and immediate solution, which literally can slash three quarters of global warming gases plaguing us, is the one thing nobody seems to be talking about. It's very simple. Change your diet. That is for sure. This is Mother Nature's fast food. You pick it up, you take a bite, and you eat it. What could be faster? <laughs> We're happy to say that now, for the first time, environmental groups, animal rights advocates, interfaith groups, and yes, even the media 
are coming together to help the world wake up to the madness of the average American diet, a self-destructive diet which is unfortunately being spread around the world, as you refer to, Donald. Very much so. But don't take it just from us. Let's hear from the experts who have studied the global warming crisis scientifically and meticulously. The hour is late. It's time to decide. I'm quite confident that you will make choice wisely. In addressing global warming issues, the scientists have made it quite clear. Climate change as a self-inflicted wound, if you like. Can wipe out the very bigger assets. We have a climate crisis that is a planetary emergency. We are so, so close to the red line that perhaps we may wake up tomorrow and find that there's nothing to save after all. We have reached a point where we have a, a real emergency. The message should be clear. Climate change must take its place along those threats like conflict, poverty. Climate change is responsible for conflicts that can only deepen in the future if we don't hack as soon as possible. It's the only thing that I believe has the power to fundamentally end the march of civilization as we know it. You will have a catastrophe, add it to, to another catastrophe. Climate change means catastrophically violent weather. Like wildfires and devastation. Rising sea levels. Rising food prices. To the spread of disease. <laughs> if the future of the world depended on me, what would I do? The North Polar ice cap is melting so fast. But what seems to me to be important is that some of the effects we are witnessing now are happening twice as fast as scientists were predicting just five years ago. A report issued earlier this year by the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change concluded both that global temperatures are rising, that this is caused largely by human activities. And if you look at the fourth assessment report of the IPCC, we've assessed several stabilization scenarios. In 2010, there could already be as many as 50 million environmentally displaced persons due to climate change, desertification, and deforestation. Experts tell us that the situation underlying the crisis is not a temporary one. And it's getting more and more difficult every day. And there's no guarantee that human civilization can survive. The doomsday clock of climate change is ticking ever faster towards midnight. We are simply not reacting quickly enough. Do we need to move faster to answer the question, yes, we do, because we have less time than we thought we had? So climate change is obviously going to have a major negative impact. The scale and the pace of environmental change at the beginning of the 21st century are a serious wake-up call to us as human beings on this planet. We know without a doubt that global warming is a reality, and the question today is not is it happening and not is it bad, but what are we going to do about it? We are all part of the problem of global warming. Let us all be part of the solution. The challenge you face is to prove to people that you are serious about adaptation to the unavoidable. Meat production and consumption is hugely intensive in terms of carbon dioxide emissions. More than all cars, trucks and ships added together. Unless we change our food choices, nothing else matters because it is meat that is destroying most of our forests. It's meat that pollutes the waters. It is meat that is creating disease which leads to all our money being diverted to hospitals. 
So um, it's the first choice for anybody who wants to save the earth. The food we eat and how it's grown and the kind of food we eat uh, matters a lot. Everything comes uh, with an environmental price, uh, beef production in particular. We consume far too much meat in this world. Because there's where the climate problem is, our meat consumption. Something that's harmful even for human health. I do eat a lot of vegetarian meals. I, I think that's something we can all do. That's one of the easiest ways uh, that we can make an immediate and quite substantial impact. There are some wonderful um, environmental benefits in terms of uh, you know, taking a couple of steps lower down the food chain. And the choice we face is a, t is a really simple one, actually. Just for one day or more than that, become a vegetarian. Let us approach climate change not simply as a looming future threat, but as a present opportunity to work together. The time for action is now. What can I, what can the government do to help? What can you do to help? How can we do this together? And it's about what we do from this point on and this point forward. Individuals can take action. We have to try our And as individuals, through the choices we make, the purchases we make. If we once understand this and take the necessary actions, then we actually have a much better situation. And if you eat less meat, you will be healthier and so would the planet. Then there's some kind of realization of individual responsibility to take care of this planet. Our generation has inherited an incredibly beautiful world and it's in, really in our hands whether our children inherit the same world. That is our duty, so that our children can have a decent quality of life on this planet. We cannot be anything less than courageous and revolutionary in our approach to tackling climate change. It's a win-win situation if you eat less meat. Living in harmony with the natural world is the only way for the future. Six billion people, one planet, one chance to get it right. Go wedge. Be green and save our planet. If you continue the way you're doing, then it will get more hope. And if the world population join in vegetarian circle, at least two thirds of them, and green technology and preserving forests and plant trees, etc., organic farming as well, a fugal lifestyle, every little effort helps along. Also, keep envisioning the positive picture of the good world, the world that you want it to be, where everyone lives in peace, in love, in safety, a vegan world, a heavenly abode, where all beings enjoy life without fear of one another, where all are treated with kindness and due respect. Just envision all that. We are so excited today to have with us one of the leaders in this movement. He is the author of the best-selling book, The World Peace Diet, Eating for Spiritual Health and Social Harmony. What a great title. What a great book. And let me introduce now Dr. Will Tuttle. It's great to be here. Uh, as we just heard, I'm Dr. Will Tuttle, and I'm the author of The World Peace Diet, and I've been a vegan for about 28 years, and uh, thank you. About maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I started thinking that someone should write a book that gives not just the environmental implications and the health implications and the implications for animal cruelty to our meals, but actually the bigger picture of what it does to us spiritually and psychologically, the history and anthropology of this whole culture, and the main role that seeing animals merely as commodities plays in our own difficulty in solving our problems. So um, I was uh, thinking that someone would, someone would write a book that would give this big picture, and I was waiting for it to be written, and my, uh, Madeline, my spouse, said, if you want to read that book, I think you would better write it. So uh, I spent five years and wrote the book, and I'm really honored to be here today and be part of this movement, which I believe in my heart is the most powerful movement on this planet for a positive evolution for peace and harmony. And I'd like to uh, take some time now to introduce Supreme Master Ching Hai. 
when I first saw the videos of Supreme Master Ching Hai back in the 1980s, I was immediately struck by her benevolent presence and her relaxed and profound wisdom. As the years have gone by, my respect for her as a spiritual teacher has grown so much that I see her as one of the most brilliant and inspiring lights shining on this earth today. Whenever I become despairing of humanity's blindness and cruelty, I need only think of Supreme Master Ching Hai and her loving and enthusiastic students and all the work they are selflessly doing to promote compassion and peace. And I know she is inspiring a great movement to raise consciousness here on this planet. When people ask me whose spiritual teachings and example I recommend most highly, it is Supreme Master Ching Hai. To me, she is a living miracle. On the outer physical side, she is a petite Asian woman from an ordinary village. Growing up in Vietnam, she partook of both the Christian and Buddhist traditions and also knew firsthand of the horrors of war. I think that from her childhood, there was a love for all life shining in her like a bright star, always leading her, and she eventually moved to Germany and married a German doctor and worked in social programs there. Her spiritual calling beckoned so strongly, though, that she felt she had to travel to India, and with her husband's loving blessing, she went to the Himalayas seeking an authentic spiritual teacher. She entered many hardships there, but eventually found a great teacher in the remote mountains and through her intense meditation practice, she attained deep insight into the nature of reality. She returned to Eastern Asia with no thought of teaching, but the light of her love and wisdom was irresistible, and she quickly became a magnet for students seeking spiritual inspiration and guidance. As awareness of her teaching and healing presence spread, thousands of people were inspired by her example and spontaneously meditation centers were formed all over the world with both regular meditation sessions as well as community outreach projects to help those in need. As I mentioned in my book, The World Peace Diet, the worldwide followers of Supreme Master Ching Hai have set up vegan restaurants in many cities and contribute vegan clothing, food, shelter, and aid to disaster victims, prisoners, children, and the elderly in countries around the world. Though she requires students to meditate two and a half hours per day, vow to eat no flesh or egg products, refrain from alcohol and non-prescription drugs, and not work in jobs that promote the exploitation of animals or people, her movement continues to spread. Rather than impede her movement, her insistence that her students reduce the cruelty in their meals may paradoxically promote it. People who are serious about spiritual growth are apparently capable of, of embracing fundamental change in their lives and may even welcome the opportunity. I feel everyone on earth owes a debt of gratitude towards Supreme Master Ching Hai and to her students as well. Kindness anywhere blesses everyone everywhere. We are all interconnected. Her efforts to bless the world are magnified by the purity of her intentions making the efforts of this petite woman absolutely enormous in their impact. People often ask me what the best strategies and methods are to help us be more effective in our advocacy for animals and the earth. Besides educating ourselves about the issues, the most important contribution we can make to the animal liberation movement is to seek authentic spiritual liberation for ourselves and the best way we can help bring peace is to cultivate inner peace. I believe Supreme Master Ching Hai lives to give, to love, to bless others constantly. She never asks people for contributions, and in fact, she refuses them. Through her amazing creativity, she is able to found countless effective relief campaigns to disaster victims all over the globe and provide helpful gifts to children, prisoners, the elderly, and the infirm. She is love in action. Personally, I am often astonished by the sheer creative genius of her jewelry and clothing designs, of her lectures, stories, and jokes, of her paintings, music, and other creations. With the help of her enthusiastic students, she publishes a vast array of books, CDs, DVDs, and magazines in over 30 languages. 
The TV station that she has inspired is unique in the world, broadcasting 24-7 in 15 languages simultaneously and emphasizing constructive news and the uplifting truth that countless people are working hard in many ways to bring healing, peace, wisdom, and beauty to our world. The hallmark of her teaching is that it is not only spiritual and transcendent, but eminently practical as well. That she has gained so many enthusiastic supporters is a testimony to humanity's essential compassion and courage. It is my great honor to welcome to our gathering the great spiritual beacon whose love and understanding light up this earth for all people, animals, and future generations. Supreme Master Ching Hai. Hello, everyone. Greeting to you. <laughs> and God bless you so much. And I want to say hello, greeting, and thank you to your honorable Chef Frank the mayor of West Hollywood, and all the scientists, professors, media representatives, and all distinguished guests who are present today. Thank you for taking uh, some of your precious time in your busy life to attend this conference, to offer your support, advices, ideas, and blessings. Together, maybe we will still be able to save the planet by working hard to remind people the solutions to global warming. I thank you again, and may God bless you so much for your noble intention. And please continue. I'm just here to listen. Just want to say hello. <laughs> Thank you so much, Supreme Master. It is so great to hear from you. And even as I listen to your voice, I can tell that you are love in action. The point is we're getting to hear from Supreme Master and that's crucial. So that's the main thing. And so once again, we are so delighted, Supreme Master, that you are there. Uh, you have done so much uh, personally. Every time I have asked for help from Supreme Master for causes, uh, whether it's rescuing the seals or stopping animal cruelty in factory farms, she and her amazing team have always been there with the utmost generosity. It brings tears to my eyes. Uh, and I just think she's an amazing example for all of us. So let's hear it for Supreme Master. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane. I would like to introduce you to a truly remarkable man. He is a cowboy. He's made history exposing the most toxic secrets of agribusiness. Fondly called the Mad Cowboy, Howard Lyman spent his career as one of the largest cattle feed operators in the United States until something happened. And that was a battle with cancer. And it turned him into one of the most vocal vegan activists the world has ever seen. He became world famous after an appearance on Oprah. You probably remember it. It rattled meat markets around the world. And he is going to tell us all about that. Howard, come on and talk to us, because you're the man. You're the man who got me to go vegan. I interviewed you 10 years ago. And you asked me if I was a vegan, and I said, I'm just a vegetarian. You said liquid meat, and I never touched dairy from that moment on. Thank you very much, Jane. We're here today. We're approaching the cliff at 200 miles an hour. The politicians and the bureaucrats are talking about not to worry. They're going to give the best care possible to those that survive at the bottom of the cliff. <laughs> I'm a fourth generation farmer, rancher, feedlot operator. I travel around the world and I talk to people about the proper amount of animal products to have in their diet as being zero. What I want to tell you is that I spent 45 years of my life in production agriculture. What we are doing today in America on our farms and ranches is absolutely, totally non-sustainable. We need to change. 
I was raised during the Second World War. We had the largest organic dairy farm in the state of Montana. My parents couldn't hire any help, and my mother and father were milking cows. That meant that I was raised by my grandparents. Back then, there was no such thing as swing slides or Lego blocks. My first job, five years old, was working in the garden. Birds, trees, and living soil. I thought it was the Garden of Eden. The only thing I ever wanted to be was a farmer. I spent the first 12 years of my life doing nothing but partying and playing football because I knew I was going to be a farmer. But when I went to that farmer, that business to be run, I didn't have the tools to run a business. I was dumber in a post. I didn't let that bother me any. I did what most good red-blooded American youth 12 years of going to school and not learning anything, I immediately went on to the university. <laughs> I went to the university because I wanted to be an agribusinessman. Now, I couldn't spell it, but I knew that's what I wanted to be. I learned a thing about herbicides, pesticides, hormones, and medication. I soaked it up like a sponge. I was going to go home and take that organic farm and turn it into an agribusiness. I graduated with a degree in agriculture and I went home and I said to my father, I said, move over, Pop. I'm going to take this one horse business and I'm going to turn it into an agribusiness. And he said, what in the world is that? And I said to him, didn't you ever hear about better living through chemistry? He said, no, our job is to work with nature. I said, that's old fashioned. Our job is to feed a hungry world. I never met a chemical that I didn't like. Herbicides, pesticides, hormones, and medication. I took that one horse farm and over a period of years, I turned it into an operation where I had 7,000 head of cattle. I can't tell you what a thrill it was the first time I wrote a check for a million dollars and it didn't bounce. <laughs> And I thought, man, I have arrived. I'm the Donald Trump of agriculture. <laughs> but just when I was on top of the world, I got a wake-up call. I ended up paralyzed from the waist down. I had a tumor on my spinal cord, and the doctor told me, he said, if that tumor is on the inside of the cord, you have less than one chance in a million you will ever walk again. Here I am, waiting for an operation. A lot of things going through my mind. It was not about owning seven combines at $100,000 a piece or 20 tractors or 30 trucks. What was going through my mind is why I became a farmer. Birds, and trees, and living soil. I saw the birds die, the trees die. I saw the soil change. And it was not until I was paralyzed I was willing to admit I was the problem not the solution. They operated on me for 12 hours. Cut the bone off of the back of my spinal column. Sure enough, the tumor was on the inside of the cord. They split the covering on the cord. Not only was it on the inside, it was under the cord. They could not lift the cord up to get to the tumor. All they could do was pick a nerve, cut it. They took out a tumor the size of my thumb. I walked out of the hospital with a one in a million operation. But I guarantee you I walked out a much different individual. I knew that it was not about more land or more cattle or more equipment. There was more to it than just being bigger and richer. I went to my banker and I said to him, I said, I need your help. We need to start farming with nature. My banker, he reared back in his chair and he said, what in the world does that mean? <laughs> I said, I think we need to become organic farmers. And he looked at me and he said, you want me to lend you money? You're not gonna share it with my other customers, the chemical dealer, the pharmaceutical dealer, the fertilizer dealer? He said, there will never be a day like that. And so 1983, I sold my farm, I paid my debts. And I started working with other farmers to start producing food correctly. I learned 
that there is a lot of money out there that do not want people to know the truth. I started talking to people about not eating animals. Talk to them about mad cow disease. They thought I was the one that had holes in my brain because they'd never heard of it. But I ended up on the Oprah show. I told a few million people that we were grinding up cows and feeding them back to cows. That we were scraping up roadkill, deer, elk, possum, raccoons, and we were feeding those back to cows. And then we were taking euthanized pets, dogs and cats, full of chemicals that were used to kill them. The city of Los Angeles alone, 200 tons of dogs and cats a month are being ground up and put it back into the feed for our pets or our food animals. Oprah, her eyes were as big as saucers. She turned around and looked at the guy from the National Cattlemen's Beef Association and said, Dr. Weber, are we feeding cows to cows? I will never forget what he had to say. Uh, yo, there's a, <laughs> a limited amount of that going on. Well, the next thing out of Oprah's mouth got us sued. She said, that stops me cold. I will never again eat a burger. Now, I knew that 13 states had a thing called the food disparagement law. But the food disparagement law said it was against the law to say anything you knew to be false. I told the truth. But guess what? The cattlemen sued. They didn't want the people to know the truth. They ended up suing us for six years, hundreds of thousands of dollars defending our right to tell the American people the truth. I want you to realize sitting here today that if we don't deal with the truth, if we don't realize the fact that the majority of Americans today are dying from pain inflicted by their fork, we're digging more graves with our fork than any other tool that's out there. We need to look at what's going on in the world. We need to understand that Easter Island, for example, when you have these large stone monuments set up on the beach, at one time was a vibrant society. Rich soil, trees, boats, fish. But in there, your stature was how big a stone monument you put up. Well, there were some stowaways came to the island. Rats. They didn't care because the rats were not eating the human food. They were eating the seeds from the palm trees. As they cut down the trees to sled the large monuments down to the beach, there were fewer and fewer trees because no new trees were growing. Can you imagine what it was like when the last monument cut the last tree and there were never going to be any more trees on Easter Island? The monuments are there today. The people are gone because they could not learn to live within their environment. It's the same thing we're faced with today. We need to understand that the tipping point between everything being fine and total disaster is a very fine line. If we look at St. Matthew's Island, for example, 1943, they put 29 reindeer on an island so they would have a backup food supply for the military detachment that was there. They never needed them. 29 reindeer on a 128 square mile island with no natural predators. 20 years that 29 island animals went to 6,000 fat, sleek, healthy animals in 20 years. 20 years later, there was not one live animal left on the island because they did not learn to live within the environment that they had. We have the same problem right now. When the boat people came to the United States a little under 300 years ago, we had the deepest, richest topsoil on the face of the earth. In 300 years, 
we have lost 75% of all of the topsoil that was here. It takes 500 years to produce an inch of topsoil. We haven't been here long enough to produce an inch of topsoil and we've lost three quarters of what was here. 1850 in Iowa, they built a church. From 1850 in Iowa till today, that church has been in continuous use. In 1850, they took a picture of it. All of the land around the church was farmed. All of it was at the same elevation. Over 150 years later, they took another picture of the same church. All of the land around it was still farmed. The only difference is the church sits 10 feet higher today than all of the farm ground around it. If we are going to survive as a homo sapien species, we need to understand the fact that 80% of all of the grain that are produced in the United States of America today is stuffed down the throat of an animal. It takes 16 pounds of grain to produce one pound of meat. 16 pounds of grain, you can feed 32 hungry people. Which is the best use of our resources? We need to understand that the future is to feed healthy people, not animals to kill them. I spent 45 years of my life in animal production. I will tell you that what we're doing today is absolutely, totally non-sustainable. I changed from a meat-eating animal production person to a person today that is a vegan, eating nothing with a face, liver, or a mother. I changed my diet for my health. I do what I do today as a hardcore vegan for the love of the animals. I know that no animal has to die for me to live. If we are going to survive as a species, we have to understand that our job is not to do everything. Our job is to do everything that we can do. And I charge you today with a very simple, straightforward charge. All you have to do is what you can do. Go veg, go green. Save the planet. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Howard, for your insight and for this remarkable story. It's certainly been most informative and educational, and as you can imagine, some of the members in our audience right now have a few questions. Mr. Lyman, you have uh, taken my breath away. Thank you for your love for coming here today to be with us. My name is Betska Kaber. I am co-president of Coaching and Leadership International. We are the global leaders in mind, body, spirit, coach training, and I'm also the president of ecofoodprint.com. I have a very important question for you, and that is, should we put the carbon tax on meat? Woo! And if yes, how do we do that? The first question is, should we put a carbon tax on meat? The answer to that is yes. How do we do that? Remember, I spent five years working on Capitol Hill. I learned a thing that was called the golden rule. Them that got the gold are making the rules. <laughs> the question is, how are we going to do it? It's simple. If you can take a fourth generation farmer, rancher, feedlot operator, and I can change and become a hardcore vegan, 
Does that mean that the people that care about the environment can't? 79% of Americans claim to be vegetarian. If you're actually going to claim to be a vegetarian, how about walking your talk? If we are going to change this, it is not going to happen in Washington, D.C. It's going to happen right here. Look at what has happened in West Hollywood, what they have been able to do in this community. We need to go in our own communities. We have to organize. We have to look at what's not available. And if it's not available, we need to start it. If there are changes that need to happen, we need to be the people that start the change. Our job is to become the leader so that when we look in the eyes of a child, we can basically say to them, I can't do everything, but I can do everything that I can do. And if we don't, there will not be a future for our children and grandchildren. Can we do it? Absolutely. When should we start? Right now. My name is Daryl Cumberbatch, and I'm a green accountant from Toronto, Canada. My question to you is, should there be warning labels on meat for the chemicals, drugs, and hormones that cause cancer and other diseases such as diabetes? If we look at what should be the absolute textbook of answering your question, it's Dr. T. Colin Campbell's book, the China study. It is not only the, the chemicals we're using in producing meat, but look at the fact that it is animal protein that is the number one cause of heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and obesity. The largest dietary study that has ever been done in the history of the world. Is it worse when they end up with the chemicals in it and the hormones in it and the antibiotics in it? Absolutely. But if you want to live a long, healthy life, realize that our maker did not build junk. He ended up giving us a phenomenal body. If we would just end up consuming what we were designed for, and it is not hamburger, T-bone steaks, or pork chops. I never saw in 45 years of my life an animal going to the slaughterhouse, clicking their heels and saying, oh, yippee skippy, I'm going to be a burger tomorrow. They do not want to die. Our job is to make sure that they are able to live the life they were intended to live so that we can live the life we were intended to live. It's an honor to um, experience your energy. And um, our American Indian people are our nation's first environmentalists. My question to you is, meat wouldn't be such an industry without a fast food retail channel. What can be done about it? When we stop and look at fast food restaurants today, how many of you ever realize how many of your dollars are going out there subsidizing the price of that hamburger being as cheap as possible? If it was not for the subsidy from the American taxpayers, we would be looking at a burger, a four ounce burger costing about $12. Do you believe that the people going to fast food restaurants would be lining up at $12 for a burger without the subsidy? How many of them realize that when we talk about a thing like a mad cow disease, that it takes the amount of material about that'll cover the sharp end of a pin 
to cause a disease that is 100% fatal. If we took one of those four ounce burgers and we took it to a DNA lab, we would find there are between 500 and 1,000 different animals in one burger. Do you feel comfortable that one of those was not infected? Do you think that we could not use the subsidy from the American taxpayers for education, social security, senior citizens, to rebuild our roads and bridges? Do you realize today that the United States of America is spending between 30 and $60 billion to import $20 billion worth of oil from the Middle East? Could we not do better? Should we not be doing what Al Gore is talking about, taking 10 years and making us self-sufficient in electricity? Could we do this? Absolutely, we could do it. We can actually end up with safe, healthy food that costs what it should cost and not subsidized by the American people and taking our tax dollars and doing the things we really want to see more of. Thank you, Howard. And I believe our next question is directed to Supreme Master Ching Hai. My name is Steve Behrman, or Swami Beyond Ananda when I put my turban on. Uh, that's when I channel the Swami, so the turban's off. He's channeling me now. There it was. Supreme Master Ching Hai, I appreciate opportunity to be here. On a recent uh, TV program, you suggested that the government could actually subsidize farmers to grow vegetables. Could you make a, a further comment about that, please? Yes, sir. First of all, I would like to thank Mr. Howard Lindman for his exceptionally good, uh, good speech and uh, extraordinary example. If he, as a wealthy uh, cattle farmer, can forsake just everything in one go like that to become vegan, then I believe everyone could learn from his example. He had more to lose than many of us. But he did forsake everything to become a vegan. Thank you, sir, for being a shining example. Mr. Swami, organic farming is always ideal for health and ecology, as we have uh, had it proven from the scientists. And now, organic farming, not only good for health and ecology, it keeps water clean and environment safe. Because at present, this practice is not widely spread and encouraged by the government or by the media so, in my humble opinion, instead of subsidize for the farmers uh, who lose money on meat or because the meat was tainted with the uh, disease or something, instead of subsidize for that, uh, the government can subsidize the farmers so they have uh, more uh, financial support to fall on until this become more stabilized as a practice and the market has more demand for organic food. Then farmers will be happy to grow more vegetarian food to supply for the health of a human and the planet. That's what I mean by subsidize more for the organic farming because it helps uh, in many, many angles, not just health, but the water, the health of the planet, and right now we are short of food. So if the farmers are encouraged to grow more on the government to support and subsidize, then of course we will have no problem then and people will have more vegan food to choose from and the farmer will also be happy to supply. That's what I meant. Thank you, Swami. Master. 
Howard and Supreme Master Ching Hai. Thank you both for your amazingly insightful comments. Howard, for your eye-opening speech. You know, the whole world needs to hear what Supreme Master is saying and what Howard Lyman is saying. And I just wonder, why is it that it takes Supreme Master to tell the world what really the mainstream media should be telling the world but isn't? You know, ask yourself that question, why are they not conveying this information? All you have to do is look at the television commercials and you'll have your answer. Think about it. You know, Jane, she's a vegan, but she's so energetic. If you look at her, everyone <laughs> should feel like they want to be vegan right away. Look at the energy she has all the time, not just today, all the time. Thank you, Supreme Master. I saw you on many programs. You're always like this. <laughs> you are a very good example of a vegan person. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Supreme Master. And you know, my mother is 92, and she's a vegetarian, and she's the oh. one who taught me this. And wow. um, she is amazingly sharp. She doesn't have Alzheimer's. She's on the internet. She's on YouTube. She's on Google. She's wow. always telling me to get off the internet because uh, she wants to use it. And uh, <laughs> so you want to live long and healthy, go vegan. You'll be 92 and you'll be running around like a pistol. That's right. That's right. And now we have a very short video uh, that really outlines this problem. And you know, so many people just don't want to face it. They don't want to watch the videos. They don't want to see what's really going on. And I applaud all of you and all of you watching at home for taking a look at this important information about the realities of livestock's long shadow. Well, we've got quite a program planned for you. And uh, I'm so happy the whole world is watching and listening to this because thanks to Supreme Master Ching Hai, um, this information is getting out to the world. Again, 30 languages and more, 14 satellites and the internet. This is being broadcast around the globe and people are watching and people are changing as a result. 
Now we are going to have our first of three panels, and we're so excited to have some of the real top experts in this field, in this movement with us today. Dr. Gurminder Singh of the Green Technology Institute, Dr. Jim Stewart of the Sierra Club's Global Warming Committee, and last but not least, Professor Ryan Galt, a leading agriculture expert from the University of California, Davis. First, let's start with Dr. Singh. What is going on with this planet? I understand that you have some shocking new data to tell us about, and it involves global warming. We want to hear it, and the world wants to hear it. Tell us about it. Well, let me get it to the point. Uh, we passed the tipping point. The tipping point has been reached uh, about a year ago. And uh, what scientists are not talking about is that carbon is not the problem. There are three or four other gases and at the top of them is methane. Methane is 23 times more toxic than carbon, the carbon footprint. What happened at Kyoto Protocol was politicians got together and developed a document that was com compromising the message. We talked about CO2, and the world knows about CO2 now. But CO2 alone is not the problem. Methane is. Besides methane, there is nitric oxide, 300 times more toxic. Now, when you mix all of that gases, and you start looking at what that is doing to the global footprint, Global warming is accelerating at a very, very fast rate. And today we need to know the truth that this scientific data that we are seeing today is gone far beyond where we think we, we you know, we five years ago were saying the world will be, uh, lose its ice caps in 60 years. We're losing it in four years now. We are revising every fact every single day because some of these things that we are, we are not paying attention to are the leading cause. And this leading cause, when you start looking at methane, methane comes from the permafrost, methane comes from the oceans warming up, and methane comes from animal breeding. When, when you mix all of these three things, you find we are now heading towards a tech catastrophe at a shorter period of time than anyone have ever planned for. Prince Charles said, beyond 18 months, we are past the tipping point. We are past, you would say, the point where we can not return. But we, as, human, as a human society, we can do a lot. We can do a lot to make changes in our lives. This comes down to you and us. It's about no longer saying who else is out there that we can blame. We are the, the solution. We are the problem. That's for sure. Dr. Singh, you have a question to ask Supreme Master. What I wanted to ask is that given all the facts that we are seeing, given the facts on the ground, the changes that are happening, what else out there that the human eye is not able to see, what else the world needs to know that we do not know about at the present moment? That would be my question. Concerning the point of no return, I'm happy to inform you that we have not passed it yet. And uh, what Prince Charles had meant was that at that time we had about 18 months to change our destiny. Like we should go veg completely, go green quickly and to save the planet. 
But now uh, I'm very happy to inform you if uh, anyone believe uh, my humble opinion or insight that we have gained three years and four months we have now, Dr. Singh, to change. Thank you. And this is what I know from my meditation inside. I cannot prove it to you, but in case you believe it, it's good. If you don't, we still have three years and four months. And on this note, I would like to thank the new vegans, vegetarian uh, karmas who join the circle of the noble elite who lives without blood in their hand, who lives as an example of peace that begins with themselves and begins on their dinner table. Because of this, because of the effort of everyone on this planet who knows, who are aware of our uh, predicament at the moment, they have been trying to work very hard to go out of their way to spread the news, the information about the danger we are facing and also to spread the news about a solution we could all take action to save the planet. Therefore, many more people joining our vegetarian and vegan circles now. And that's why we have gained time. I know we have also the plant trees and a little technology here and there and changing some bulbs and all that and turn off the light one hour here and there. These also help but very little compared to the um, blessing merit of vegetarian and vegan uh, diet because once they turn their heart into this compassionate direction, the compassionate and loving energy that generates is enormous. That's why we can combat the negative power who want to destroy our planet before we could even have a chance to be awakened spiritually. So I'm very happy to tell you we have a little time. And as we go on, maybe we gain more time. And let's hope so. Thank you so much, Dr. Singh. Don't worry, uh, we are okay for now. <laughs> I mean, not really okay. <laughs> we are not really okay, but we are okay. We have hope. You are working. We are working together, and perhaps we still can make it. Hmm? Who knows, Dr. Singh? Miracles can always happen. Oh, absolutely. Now, Dr. Jim Stewart. Can you share with us the depth and the scope of the crisis that we're facing? Exactly how serious is this? Well, I think that uh, Dr. Singh has already talked about uh, a lot of the, uh, of the crisis, but we can, of course, uh, talk about uh, some specifics in terms of uh, the sea level rising. And uh, if we do lose the Greenland ice cap and the West Antarctica ice shelf, the uh, sea level will rise uh, 40 to uh, 50 feet or uh, uh, 14 meters, and uh, that will, of course, uh, devastate uh, many, many uh, countries in the world. We're also uh, facing a uh, crisis relative uh, to the, uh, the droughts in some places and floods in other places, as we're well aware of. And uh, the water crisis is becoming uh, even worse because of the fact of the increase in the uh, global temperature means that crops actually need more water in order to be able uh, to grow. And so therefore, at the same time as we're getting less water, we're getting less snowfall and uh, less uh, opportunity to uh, save water in the mountains, we're also needing more water. And of course, everyone is well aware of the fact that the uh, forests are also drying out, and so we're having much, much more prevalent uh, forest uh, fires and uh, much more intense than uh, we ever had uh, before. But I do want to bring a bit of hope to this situation, and that is the technology to solve the global warming crisis is here. We do not need to wait for any new technologies. The, as Al Gore announced uh, last week, that uh, there, the technology is available within 10 years to go 100% renewable electricity. And I recommend that you go to uh, his website, wecansolveit.org and the speech is there, and the details of how this plan could happen are there. Another solution 
in addition, of course, uh, to the vegetarian and veganism that we've been talking about, is organic farming. The scientists, and perhaps uh, you know, Dr. Galt can uh, tell b b more about this, but the scientists have shown that organic farming sequesters far more carbon than the normal uh, kind of, uh, of uh, pesticide, uh, et cetera, uh, uh, farming. And so that you really can, if we could get if everybody to go organic farming, we would really save a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. The other ray of hope that I would like to present uh, today is contained in a uh, act that's called AB 32 in California. It's the Global Warming Solutions Act. And just a few weeks ago, they came out with their proposal for the draft scoping plan. The fact that there is in, this plan is even in existence is totally inspiring because what this plan does is it looks at all of the global major global warming emissions that are happening from the entire state of California and all the 36 million people that live here and all the industries, and they have calculated how much it would require to make the reductions to get back to 1990 levels by the year 2020, which is about a 30% reduction from business as usual. And they have gone through and they have come up with a detailed proposal of how they can reach the 170 million tons per year uh, by 2020 in terms of, of the reductions. And I recommend that all of you uh, go on the uh, website. Uh, it's uh, www.arb.ca.gov. And the Air Resources Board for the state of California has this plan, and they also are asking for comments. And I want to say that they mention in this plan of agriculture is woefully inadequate. There's no mention made of organic agriculture, which has been proven to uh, save global warming. There's no mention made of uh, the aid that would happen if people went to uh, vegetarian or vegan diets. And so you are invited on this website to go make your comments. And I urge all of you and everyone throughout the entire world that's listening to this broadcast to go. You don't ha have to be a California resident to comment on this because this plan is a blueprint. If this plan could be the plan to save the entire planet. The final thing I want to say is, is that I want all of you to Take a look at this plan and work with your local city, state, and nation to ensure that this kind of comprehensive plan is taken and implemented right now before the three years are up. What's the website? A R B dot c a dot g o v and click on climate do you have any comments supreme master wonderful speech wonderful yeah. we probably have hope eh? yes will anybody please log on to that and comment the way dr jim stewart said would we do that yes. Absolutely. Yes. It's very good uh, initiative, Dr. Jim, and uh, I wholly agree with you. It would go a step further if we go veg to take care of the other half. And if we all go veg now, then we could even keep the old technology until all can be replaced. Because uh, vegetarian diet or vegan diet takes care of 80% reduction of pollution that causes uh, global warming, according to the calculation. Huh? from the scientist's uh, evidence. And it is the easiest way, the quickest way, and the safest way that we can eliminate 80% of global warming, and almost immediately. And the rest, 20% from everything else, even cars, airplanes, or everything else, can be taken care of by nature. Originally, nature can take care 
even a little bit more than that. It's just that we overloaded uh, her capacity and we over abused the Mother Earth's um, resources. So we just have to reverse our actions. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Jim. It's nice to know that the government and everyone is really uh, go out of their way to help saving the earth. I'm so happy. Because once they turn their heart into this compassionate direction, the compassionate and loving energy that generates is enormous. That's why we can combat the negative power who want to destroy our planet before we could even have a chance to be awakened spiritually. <laughs>